Hi, I'm Elizabeth Johnson. Welcome to Shakespeare Guildmaster. Today is week 10, lesson four, and we're discussing the play, Henry IV, part one. Here we've got our ideas of Western culture. Today, I'm mostly focusing on man. Specifically, we're gonna take a look at the idea of man and human nature. Well, what is human nature? Human nature is the nature of humans, especially, obviously, the fundamental dispositions and traits of humans. So some possible examples might include things like instinct, social comparison, discipline, communication, weakness, anger, hate, love, freedom, emotion, motivation, war, revenge, the list goes on and on. So many aspects of human nature that we see all through history and in people now and in ourselves. Today we're going to look at the four main characters in this play. King Henry IV, Prince Henry, Falstaff, and Hotspur, and discuss some of the aspects of human nature we can learn about from this play. The first passage I'm going to discuss comes from Act 1, Scene 1, and here we see the melancholy King Henry IV. He's showing his melancholic side by languishing in despair over the fact that his own son, Prince Henry, is not as valiant as Henry Percy um, Hotspur. So we know that a melancholic person feeds on sadness and despair. And we have already encountered another melancholic character, Jaques in As You Like It. So we're gonna take a look at this first scene of the play to see how he feels about his son, Prince Henry. Yea, there thou makest me sad, and makest me sin in envy, that my lord Northumberland should be the father to so blessed a son, a son who is the theme of honor's tongue, amongst a grove the very straightest plant, who is sweet fortune's minion at her pride, Whilst I, by looking on the praise of him, see riot and dishonor stain the brow of my young Harry. Oh, that it could be proved that some night-tripping fairy had exchanged in cradle clothes our children where they lay, and called mine Percy his Plantagenet. Then would I have his Harry, and he mine. Now, obviously, at this point, King Henry doesn't know everything about Hotspur right now. He's lamenting the fact that his own son is not properly preparing to become the next king. Consider this. Henry IV risked his life and fortune in his usurpation of the throne. And now his own son does not seem to appreciate that fact. Henry IV has spent his life in fear and has worked hard to uphold his claim as king and to uphold the claim of those who will come after him. Now, I know that Prince Henry's obviously not the perfect son here, but I always cringe when I hear a parent compare their child to someone else or even to a sibling. Something that I have learned about human nature from King Henry here is that parents worry about their children, even fear for them, and complaining and blaming are easy places for our minds to go. I am a parent. I know how much I've worried about my own children and even feared for them and sometimes complained about things that they're doing. It is difficult to hear a parent compare their child to somebody else. So we've talked a little bit about King Henry and I decided to go ahead and choose another passage that, that helps us get to know this character better. And this is from Act 3, Scene 2. And this is the long-awaited meeting of the king and his son that we knew was coming after the play acting of Prince Henry and Falstaff in Act 2, Scene 4. In here, the king lets his son know he is displeased and embarrassed because of his time spent in such inordinate and low desires, such poor, such base, such lewd, such mean attempts, such barren pleasures, rude society, thou hast lost thy princely privilege with vile participation. And he lets Hal know that his brother John has taken his place in the council 
and that everything or everyone thinks Prince Henry will fail. Here's Prince Henry's reply. I shall hereafter, my thrice gracious Lord, be more myself. As thou art to this hour, was Richard then when I from France set foot at Ravensburg, and even as I was then is Percy now. Now by my scepter and my soul to boot, he hath more worthy interest to the state than thou, the shadow of succession. Ouch! That's got a sting. So he's comparing Prince Henry to the hated King Richard, and then he compares himself, King Henry compares himself to the traitorous Percy. So even though the king knows of Hotspur's treason, he understands how much Hotspur cares about the interests of the state. Once again, we see King Henry displaying some very human characteristics of comparison, jealousy, and complaining. So I've got a question for you to think about, and this is for you to think about for yourself. So do I exhibit some of these same tendencies or displays of human nature in my own life? If so, are, are they serving me in a useful way? Or are they causing me unnecessary pain and suffering? So am I spending time comparing myself and my family members or other people to other people? Am I spending time feeling jealous of others? What am I complaining about? How often am I complaining? Am I doing it just in my mind? Am I doing it with other people? What are my fears? What do I worry about? And who am I blaming for the things that I'm doing wrong myself? These are some good questions to ask. In this next passage, we're going to talk about Hotspur, who has the characteristics of being choleric. Just as a reminder, that choleric temperament includes somebody who's hot-tempered or impulsive, quick to fight. And we certainly see that in Hotspur throughout the play. In this scene, this is Act 1, Scene 3, Hotspur is angrily confronting King Henry and the use of alliteration and plosive sounds in his words makes this passage sound so explosive with his temperament. So before I read this passage, I'm going to discuss the terms alliteration and also what a plosive sound is. Alliteration is the repetition of usually initial consonant sounds in two or more neighboring words or syllables, such as wild and woolly with the W's or threatening throngs with the THs. Plosive continents are made by completely blocking the flow of air as it leaves the body, normally followed by releasing the air. English pronunciation contains six plosive phonemes. P, B, T, D, K, and G. Listen for all of the P sounds in Hotspur's speech and also passages with alliteration. My liege, I did deny no prisoners, but I remember when the fight was done, when I was dry with rage and extreme toil, Breathless and faint, leaning upon my sword, came there a certain lord, neat and trimly dressed, fresh as a bridegroom, and his chin new reaped showed like a stubble land at harvest home. He was perfumed like a milliner, and twixt his finger and his thumb he held a pouncet box, whichever or none he gave his nose and took it away again, who therewith angry when it next came there, took it in snuff, and still he smiled and talked, and as the soldiers bore dead bodies by, he called them untaught knaves, unmannerly, to bring a slovenly unhandsome course betwixt the wind and his nobility. With many holiday and lady terms, he questioned me, amongst the rest, demanded my prisoners in your majesty's behalf. I then, all smarting with my wounds being cold, to be so pestered with a popinjay, out of my grief and my impatience, answered neglectingly, I know not what. He should or he should not, for he made me mad to see him shine so brisk and smell so sweet, 
and talk so like a waiting gentlewoman of guns and drums and wounds. God save the mark. And telling me the sovereignest thing on earth was parmaceti for an inward bruise, and that it was great pity, so it was, this villainous saltpeter should be digged out of the bowels of the harmless earth, which many a good tall fellow has destroyed so cowardly. And but for these vile guns, he would himself have been a soldier, this bald and jointed chat of his, my lord. I answered indirectly, as I said, and I beseech you, let not his report come concurrent for an accusation between my love and your high majesty. So here we have Hotspur, and he's explaining, or rather exploding, why he did not return his prisoners to the king. He had been enraged by the offensive manner of the king's envoy, who turned up at the end of the battle in spotless fine clothes to make his demands in fancy and unmanly language, with no respect for what his warriors had been through. The picture of the messenger taking delicate pinches of snuff while surrounded by the dead, dying, and wounded is vivid and sickening. So we can kind of feel for Hotspur while he's giving this speech, but it also is a display of his hot temper and how he's willing to show that temper to make a point. So the thing I learned of human nature from Hotspur is anger and revenge. He, he goes on a path where he leads to revenge. We get angry at people and sometimes we're good at tempering that anger and sometimes not but it is a human emotion that we feel. So sometimes we get so annoyed with people, we'll become angry, especially under pressure. Of course, you've seen the path that Hotspur takes himself down. Now, I am going to admit here that Hotspur is one of the most fascinating characters to me of Shakespeare's. I enjoy reading these plays that have Hotspur, or this play, he's just in the first part. Um, and I also really enjoy watching different actors play the part of Hotspur. I don't know why I find this part so fascinating, but every time I read or watch this play, I feel the sting of loss when he dies in battle at the hands of Prince Henry. And this is from Act 4, or Act 5, Scene 4. If I mistake not, thou art Harry Monmouth. Thou speakest as if I would deny my name. My name is Harry Percy. Why then, I see a very valiant rebel of the name. I am the Prince of Wales, and think not Percy to share with me in glory any more. Two stars keep not their motion in one sphere, nor can one England brook a double reign of Harry Percy and the Prince of Wales. Nor shall it, Harry, for the hour is come to end the one of us, and would to God thy name in arms were now as great as mine. I'll make it greater ere I part from thee, and all the budding honors on the crest I'll crop to make a garland for my head. I can no longer brook thy vanities. And now they fight, and the prince gives Percy a mortal wound. O oh, Harry, thou hast robbed me of my youth. I better brook the loss of brittle life than those proud titles thou hast won of me. They wound my thoughts worse than thy sword my flesh. But thoughts the slave of life, and life time's fool. And time that takes survey of all the world must have a stop. Oh, I could prophesy, but that the earthly and cold hand of death lies on my tongue. No, Percy, thou art dust and food for... For worms, brave Percy. Fare thee well, great heart, ill-weaved ambition. How much art thou shrunk, when that his body did contain a spirit, a kingdom for it was too small a bound. But now two paces of the vilest earth is room enough. So, we can tell Hotspur is impatient, irritable, and impulsive, all these I words, throughout the entire play. And in the midst of battle, he seems to lust for war and brags to the prince. For the hour is come to end the one of us, and would to God thy name in arms were now as great as mine. I can no longer brook thy vanities. 
And now this impulsive, bigger than life man dies young, at least in Shakespeare's play. In real life, he was older. Now, the prince recognizes the force of life that was in Hotspur and, and says after his death, when that this body did contain a spirit, a kingdom for it was too small a bound, but now two paces of the vilest earth is room enough. On my most recent reading of this play, I again felt conflicted with how I feel about Hotspur. Clearly he's committing treason. Clearly he has reasons for doing so. Clearly he's hot-headed and well befitting the name of Choleric or the personality of Choleric. And yet the loss of life in battle seems real and feels palpable. So an amazing realization I had on this reading of Henry the Fourth Part One this time is that Shakespeare is able to work on my own human nature as a reader or as an audience member. So he brought to light through the character of Hotspur my own real range of human emotions and experiences. And through reading this play, I felt empathy and bewilderment, sadness at the loss of life. And I even contemplated my own life and that of my family and those around me. The other play that really struck me this time thinking about life was Romeo and Juliet and just all of the young people whose lives are wasted throughout the play. And something that I thought about was I learned a lot about the kind of person that I want to be or maybe that I don't want to be by paying attention to these characters in Henry the Fourth, Part One. And now I'm going to turn to Prince Henry, our sanguine character. And we're on Act 1, Scene 2. A person who is sanguine is generally youthful, full of life, jovial, lives life to the full, enjoys a good sense of humor. In this scene, Act 1, Scene 2, Points invites a group of tavern goers, including Prince Hal and Falstaff, Bardolph and Pito, to participate in a robbery. He's got some details about some travelers coming through who are gonna have some money. But then he addresses the prince privately with this plan to deceive the others and to rob them after they rob the travelers. And Prince Henry at first says he's not gonna do it, but after a while he replies, well, I will go with thee. And then he immediately follows this up with his soliloquy about enjoying life now and repenting later. I'm going to allow you to soak in the full meaning of his words when you begin memorizing this passage next week. So I'm not going to read the whole passage now. You will get to read all of that and think about it as you're memorizing it. But with Prince Henry, we have this sense of enjoy life now and repent later. And boy, what a characteristic of human nature that can be. Now, the next scene I'm going to talk about that includes Prince Henry comes from Act 2, Scene 4. Prince Henry constantly listens to Falstaff's lies and leads him along, laughing all the while until the final reveal when Falstaff is proved to be dishonest. After the robbery that takes place in Act 2, Scene 2, Falstaff fibs about having to fight off a great number of attackers. And of course, we already know what happened. The number of attackers increases in the telling of the tale from two to four to seven to nine to 11. And this is pretty humorous to watch if you ever watch it acted out. Keep in mind as you read Prince Henry's following words, he's laughing and teasing the entire time. So here he is responding to Falstaff's tale. Oh, monstrous! Eleven buckram men grown out of two? These lies are like their father that bets them. Gross as a mountain, open, palpable. What, art thou mad? Art thou mad? Is not the truth the truth? Why, how couldst thou know these men in Kendall Gree when it was so dark thou couldst not see thy hand? Come tell us your reason. What sayest thou to this? And now Prince Henry talks uh, when he finally divulges what really happened. We too saw you four set on four and bound them, and were masters of their wealth. 
Mark now how a plain tale shall put you down. Then did we two set on you for, and with a word outfaced you from your prize, and have it. Yea, we can show it you here in the house. And Falstaff, you carried your guts away as nimbly, with his quick dexterity, and roared for mercy, and still run and roared, as ever I heard bull calf. What a slave art thou, to hack thy sword as thou hast done, and then say it was in fight. What trick, what device, what starting hole canst thou now find out to hide thee from this open and apparent shame? So after this lengthy time of allowing Falstaff to fabricate many ridiculous layers to his lie, Prince Henry outs him, and then shortly after agrees to play act the parts of King Henry and himself in conversation. If you haven't yet watched this part of the scene, there's a link on the assignment page so you can watch the scene acted out. It really highlights the characters of the prince and Falstaff. So here we have throughout Henry IV part one, we, we see the sanguine side of Prince Henry. We see him having fun and going along with other people's plans, including a robbery and making merry now and planning to repent later. That kind of seems to be where he's at. And now we come to phlegmatic Sir John Falstaff. This is act two, scene four. So he's our lazy, corpulent, easygoing, drinking, eating character in this play. And in this following passage, he's replying to Prince Henry after being caught in his lies about being attacked after the robbery. By the Lord, I knew ye as well as he that made me. Why hear you, my masters? Was it for me to kill the heir apparent? Should I turn upon the true prince? Why thou knowest I am as valiant as Hercules, but beware instinct. The lion will not touch the true prince. Instinct is a great matter. I was now a coward on instinct. I shall think the better of myself and thee during my life. I for a valiant lion and thou for a true prince. But by the Lord, lads, I am glad you have the money. Hostess clapped the doors. Watch tonight, pray tomorrow. Gallants, lads, boys, hearts of gold, all the titles of good fellowship come to you. What shall we be merry? Shall we have a play extempore? So he just continues to lie in a jovial fashion and claims that instinct allowed him to preserve the life of the prince during the attack. And then he says, shall we have a play extempore? So he gets caught in many more lies throughout the play. He tells the hostess in one scene that Prince Henry owes him a thousand pounds. And after the prince and poins still mirror receipts from his pockets while he's sleeping, Falstaff claims someone stole a precious ring and other wealth from him. At the end of the play, after Prince Henry has already killed Hotspur, Falstaff comes across the dead body, drives his sword into Hotspur's thigh, and then claims to have killed him. Here we have Act 5, Scene 4. The better part of valor is discretion. In the which better part I have saved my life. Zoons, I am afraid of this gunpowder, Percy, though he be dead. How if he should counterfeit too and rise? By my faith, I am afraid he would prove the better counterfeit. Therefore, I'll make him sure. Yea, and I'll swear I killed him. Why may not he rise as well as I? Nothing confutes me but eyes, and nobody sees me. Therefore, Sirrah stabbing Hotspur, with a new wound in your thigh, come you along with me. And now he carries Percy's body to the prince and throws the body down. There is Percy. If your father will do me any honor, so if not, let him kill the next Percy himself. I look to be either Earl or Duke, I can assure you. Why, Percy, I killed myself and saw thee dead. Didst thou? Lord, Lord, how this world is given to lying. I grant you I was down and out of breath, and so was he. But we rose both at an instant and fought a long hour by Shrewsbury clock. If I may be believed so, if not, let them that should reward valor bear the sin upon their own heads. I'll take it upon my death. I gave him this wound in the thigh. If the man were alive and would deny it, zooms I would make him eat a piece of my sword. This is the strangest tale that I, that e'er I heard. 
This is the strangest fellow, Brother John. Come, bring your luggage nobly on your back. For my part, if a lie may do thee grace, I'll gild it with the happiest terms I have. So throughout the play, we see some definite human nature coming out of Falstaff. We see a fair bit of deceit, although a lot of it's pretty jovial. A fair bit of vainglory. A lot of wasting time. Thievery. But also some humility, even if it's, kind of, you know, he's... He gets caught in this lie about the robbery and the attack, but then he just kind of, ah, okay, let's do a play. He's kind of gets over things quickly. Now, I think this has been an important discussion. Whenever I read this play, I'm reminded of how inventive Shakespeare is and how he's able to allow me to see what people are really like. And this play gives us a really good idea of what real life in England was like and what battle was like. Now we're going to continue our quest in search of human nature while reading Henry IV Part Two. As you finish each act, not each scene like with Part One, but each act, jot down something you have learned about human nature from one of the characters or what you have learned about your own human nature. Now, one literary motif that presents itself throughout Henry IV Part Two is that of illness, disease, and medicine. Just see if you can pick up on some of these tidbits. Part Two takes off right where Part One ends. Enjoy. Your assignments for the week are to read Henry IV Part Two before Week 11, Lesson 4. Remember to jot down after each act something you learned about one of the character's human nature or your own human nature. Keep reviewing your memorization. You have an essay to write. I want you to write about something you learned about human nature from one of these characters in Henry IV Part I. King Henry, Prince Henry, Falstaff, or Hotspur. And for fun, Listen to Hotspur defending himself from insubordination. This great speech with all of those plosive sounds and alliteration. I've got two links that you can watch. And then I also have the link to Act 2, Scene 4, where Prince Henry and Falstaff take turns play acting the king and the prince. That's all I've got for today. I'll see you next time.